Well, hello everyone and good afternoon. Welcome, good morning, uh, good evening. Welcome to Adolescence at the HIV of COVID uh, and HIV, the intersection. Um, it is my pleasure this afternoon to introduce and to welcome you to the series of Adolescent and HIV webinars. So this is a joint project on behalf of the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation and IAVI. Um, and this is in an effort to really once again shine a spotlight on research being done with and on adolescents um, to understand better how we can provide quality care, quality prevention, quality programming for adolescents around the world. The focus, of course, is on uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly Eastern and Southern Africa, but we welcome international um, stakeholders, collaborators, as well as people, obviously, from the continent. This afternoon, we have a very exciting um, lineup, and I'm excited to be telling you more about the individuals who, who will be sharing this afternoon. But of course, this is the first of a series. So there will be a further five of these webinars following monthly. Uh, if you enjoy this, we hope you will spread the word to your friends, colleagues, collaborators, and make sure that they diarize the webinars that are coming. Today, we'll be focusing on the intersection of HIV and COVID-19. We felt that was the most topical um, uh, sort of topic to get out of the way, but we'll be following on issues of mental health, issues around um, non-communicable diseases, nutrition, um, and a variety of different aspects where we believe adolescent health uh, really needs to go in this part of the world. So uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce and, and lead you through the lineup. But before I do that, we invite you to take your, um, your uh, handheld um, devices and just type in the word menti.com into Google or whatever your uh, browser is uh, and use the code, as you see lined up here, 54278371, because at the end of the, the given presentations, we will be um, having a, a poll where you yourselves can actually share uh, your beliefs, what you think are the issues, um, and we will uh, be able to, um, as I say, hear your voices in this as well. Our lineup this afternoon involves, um, first of all, Bekazeli, uh, Bekazela Saziba, who will be talking to us about the challenges of involving adolescents with HIV in research. And Bekazela is a medical doctor with a master's degree in public health from UNISA, where she actually received the Graduate Excellence Award in 2016. She's a young researcher with seven years experience in conducting research involving adolescent girls and young women within the uh, DAIDS uh, directed networks and non-network studies. She's currently undergoing mentorship and is the investigator of record for three protocols at the Spillhouse CRS in Harare, Zimbabwe. And in the words of my good friend, Yoradzo Mgodi, she is the uh, rising star in Harare. So I'm really excited to have Becca Zella here this afternoon and she'll give her talk. This will be followed by um, a poetry reading from another a rising star, Kondiswa Jones, who will uh, share uh, her reflections. And this is a bespoke poem uh, in honor of today's proceedings. Um, and I'll introduce her in a moment. And then um, a doyen, a guru of adolescent research, will be hearing from Professor Audrey Pettifor, um in a pre recorded session on the attitudes and behaviors of US college students during the COVID 19 pandemic. And I will introduce uh, Audrey uh, shortly. But let us uh, turn to the questions we'll be asking you because we'd like you to think about them throughout the next hour and then get ready to, um, to actually poll. So the questions are the following. We would like you to rank 
uh, these options in terms of importance for research on adolescents and COVID-19. So COVID-19 outcomes, COVID-19 vaccine safety and efficacy, increasing uptake of COVID-19 prevention strategies in adolescents, and the impacts of COVID-19 and risk reduction strategies on social and structural outcomes. So just think about the order that you would put those in and um, uh, rank them in the order of importance. And then secondly, rank these strategies in order of which is the most effective for maintaining adolescent retention in HIV care during COVID-19. And that would be multi-month prescriptions and dispensing, providing virtual adherence support, ensuring continuity of supply chains, and providing virtual psychosocial support. So uh, go ahead and um, already uh, submit your poll or wait until the end. We're, we're quite happy we will come back to the polls um, in, in a short while. But without further ado now, uh, it is my pleasure to hand over to Becca Zella and ask her to take us through her presentation. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Linda Kiel. Uh, good day, colleagues. I'm glad I got um, the opportunity to share with you challenges that us researchers face in involving adolescents with HIV in the context of COVID-19. Um, my name is Begezela Siziba, and I'm from Zimbabwe. Next slide. This is the outline of the presentation, and I'll start with a slide on introduction. I'll jump straight to the challenges in involving adolescents with HIV in research and conclude with the possible solutions to address some of the outlined challenges. Next slide. Based on the UN AIDS data, approximately 1.7 million, 1 million adolescents, that is aged between the ages of 10 to 19, and were living with HIV in 2019. And in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, three, two out of three newly infected adolescents aged between 15 to 19 were girls. Um, adolescents and young people are the drivers of the HIV pandemic, and it is therefore crucial for researchers to understand um, adolescents HIV. And with the successful rollout of art in children, we have an expanding population of adolescents with HIV. Therefore, there is need to understand what works and what doesn't work for this population. The overall goal is to improve outcomes for adolescents with HIV, to reach global targets for an AIDS-free generation by 2030, and to achieve this, we require evidence-based interventions and policies. Next slide. Now we'll move on to the challenges. I group the challenges into three. Challenges related to being an adolescent, challenges related to the HIV status, as well as challenges related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Challenges related to adolescents, they are grouped again into three. Challenges um, related to the individual or to the pe person, to the person. Challenges related to the uh, uh, family or to the logistics, and challenges related to the community at large. Under challenges related to the individual or to the um, to the person. Um, adolescents may fail to be involved in research because of lack of understanding due to the immaturity. Many ad adults have difficulties in understanding research, and this is more so for adolescents. Adolescents have, may have poor understanding of HIV itself, how the disease progresses, and added to that, research involves the consenting process 
and that could be a huge burden for an adolescent. Lack of adherence to treatment protocols. Characteristically, adolescents are adventurous and they are risk takers. They might want to miss their doses and not observe any immediate effects of missing their doses. And therefore think that researchers or investigators, um, they unnecessarily emphasize on adherence to treatment protocols. And that would affect validity of the trial results and impact on their health as well. Adolescents may have self-presentation bias. They may pre present the person that investigators or researchers want to see and not the true self. Adolescents may fail to connect with adult researchers. We had one such experience in one of the prevention studies that we had in MTN 034. One of our um, participants who seroconverted could not express herself during interviews because she felt inhibited to, to express herself. Next slide. So on the challenges related to being an adolescent. Adolescents may understand research well enough to want the potential benefits and not the important details about participation. For example, they might um, not be interested in adhering to study product, but they'll be interested in the youth friendly um, zone. So they want to come to the clinic, they would want to come to the, for their study visits, but not necessarily for the study procedures. Adolescents may feel not uh, adequately rewarded by giving information. For example, this participant actually said, the reimbursement that we get from here is too small for, for us. Next slide. Still on challenges related to adolescents. This could be familial or logistical. Parental or guardian consent. As guardian um, consent or parental consent is necessary, it could be or it could present a significant barrier to adolescent participation in research, especially if the parent or the guardian does not understand the research themselves, or they might have mistrust of the investigators. They could have um, previous um, unfriendly experience with the healthcare system, and therefore might not consent to their adolescents' involvement in research. Access to trial sites. Clinical trial evaluation impose an inconvenience and uncertainty to participants, and the burden is exaggerated for adolescents. Um, participants will need to come for evaluations on multiple visits, and adolescents might find this very difficult for them. Competing interests. Adolescents may have competing interests like school, after school programs, and sometimes they might not be autonomous individuals and might miss visits because of, comp of competing home or school activities. Next slide. Still, on challenges related to being an adolescent. There are community level barriers. The community might think the research is not beneficial to them, but to the investigators. And therefore adolescents might not participate because of the discouragement from the community. There are myths and misconceptions related to research. For example, during one of the outreach activities for one of the research studies that we are doing, there was talk that all what investigators want is blood. Mm -hmm. They could be perceived stigma to the research. For example, this court says, if you participate in research, oh, we know your HIV status. So adolescents might not participate in research if there is negative or peer negative influence 
around the community. Next slide. Now we'll move on to the challenges related to the HIV status. Self-stigma. An adolescent might not want to participate in research because they think there is no uh, benefit in participating in research. They would say, why should I participate? I'm already infected. They don't have any thought beyond their HIV status. Stigma as, result, as research will be focused on HIV. Opportunistic infections. Being HIV infected, they might get ill once in a while. And during those um, episodes might fail to attend to study visits. Adolescents might attribute their HIV status to other causes. Uh, for example, witchcraft. We had one such experience in MTN034. A participant who had seroconverted, though she was an adolescent, young, less than 18, she actually attributed her HIV status to her grandmother. And she wouldn't make effort um, about the HIV status in terms of taking medication or seeking um, treatment. Burden of medication. Because the, um, the adolescent um, would have this HIV condition, they might be taking a lot of medication for the HIV, for the opportunistic infections, and coming for their study visits, being involved in research, it might present a burden. And if they are on any additional medication because of the research, they, they, they could face a burden in terms of the medication. Adolescents might have a fear of the unknown because of their HIV status. Additionally, adolescents living with HIV, they face mental health challenges such as depression and anxiety, and that will make their adherence to treatment uh, protocols or to their medications a challenge. Next slide. Now we'll move on to challenges related to the COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a huge impact in the conduct of research with most activities being restricted and those already activated studies having to come up with innovative strategies to continue uh, study procedures. Withholding of research activities. Uh, we have an, ex an experience in the CTU with IMPACT 2016, which was um, a behavioral co cognitive study on H HIV adolescents. This study could not kick off because of the COVID-19 restrictions because it required um, interview, in-person interviews and um, participants to be seen in groups at the study clinics. Failure to access research sites leading to misvisits. With the COVID-19 pandemic and its travel restrictions, both participant and staff fail, would fail to reach the clinic on time. This would result in either misvisits or a prolonged time at the clinic for the study participants. Limitations related to remote or online interviews. With the strategies um, to advert the, the challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic, online interviews were being done for some research activities. And this was a limitation in some because you could not assess the nonverbal communication. Um, and this is significant in adolescence. Increased cost of conducting research. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to have a PPE, and that was an increased expense for both the participant as well as um, the research staff. Transport to and from the site was um, more expensive. With the COVID-19 restrictions, 
um, it meant that there was reduced household income because most of the participants are either self-employed or if they were in, employed, companies would, were cutting down on their staff. So the reduced household income would mean there was, there was reduced food supply. For example, one of our participants actually said, I cannot take pills because I'll be very hungry. I don't have food. Next slide. I thought it was not going to be enough to go through the challenges and not talk a bit about the possible solutions to solve these challenges. One solution to solve the problems is to involve adolescents in the design of the research. For example, in MTN 034, adolescents were engaged in pre-study meetings that included the Youth uh, Community Advisory Board and um, the researchers received ideas on what adolescents would expect in a research. And the interim results that were re re released in July this year for this study, they speak to this um, strategy. Having adolescent centers services. Peer providers. Adolescents can be trained to provide services to their peers. For example, there's an organization called the Swandiri. They have a group of young people who work as frontliners and advocate um, for in HIV infected adolescents and they provide the much needed peer support known as um, CATS. Adolescent, having an adolescent friendly staff in the MTN 034 trial, there was concerted effort to have a more youthful staff that will attend to the, to the adolescents. Age appropriate incentives. Having regular renovations to the youth friendly zone to accommodate new trends. The youth friendly zone in 2015 could be different from the youth friendly zone in 2021. And as researchers, we should um, renovate our youth friendly zone so that we can accommodate any new trends that will make the adolescents more comfortable to come to the clinic. Enhance adherence counseling. I just brought this up as a possible solution, though it didn't work so well in one of our adolescent studies, HPTN 082, but enhanced adherence counseling could assist adolescents in realizing and uh, improving their adherence. Regular and consistent engagement with adolescents. Adolescents um, always want to be in touch for them um, to, to, to participate fully. We can have online participant support groups, WhatsApp groups, adherence support groups, which could be in person or it could be online. It is important to engage parents and guidance in the general community so that we can address the myths and misconceptions and the perceived stigma from these significant others. Establishing collaborations with key stakeholders is very important when we um, conduct research. Revise recruitment strategies. I'll speak to the experience that we had in HPTN 08401. Though uh, it was a prevention uh, protocol, but um, it's revising recruitment strategies from the face-to-face -face, face -face, um, recruitment strategies that we were used to, to the phone call uh, visits for recruitment proved to be a significant strategy. Next slide. Um, I've come to the end of the presentation. I would like to thank the organizers of this um, seminar for the opportunity to present. And I'll give special thanks to my mentors, um, Dr. Mkodi, Dr. Mshanga, and Dr. Linda for the mentorship. Thank you.
Thank Becca Zella. Wonderful to hear from you this afternoon. I think that was a tour de force. It certainly set the scene for the whole series. Um, and I hope everyone is really looking forward to um, having built on that foundation to really dig deep into every and share in each other's experiences. So thank you, Becca Zella. Hang around. We would love to have you in the panel uh, towards the end of, of this webinar. It's my great pleasure now um, to ask um, uh, Ms. Konyiswa James, who is a cultural worker in Cape Town, South Africa. She's a performance artist, a theater performer, an actress, a writer, and an activist. And this afternoon, she's done us the great honor and pleasure of actually constructing a poem for us. And so over to you, Konyiswa. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Linda. Um, I just want to make one clarification, which I think you've already picked up on, which is that my name is Gondi Swad James, not Jones, but I appreciate that things get lost in translation sometimes. And um, also, I would like to think of this segment less as entertainment, because that's not what I do, as opposed to an intervention. Thank you all for receiving me. We wake up to a tomorrow of death, a still morning on a battlefield. We had thought we understood the landscape, the creeping quiet of an insidious predator, something stalking in the distance and us shrouded in a protection spell at the center of the field. There is a siren. It is a Thursday at midnight and the call sounds for us to lock our gates and mark our doors with the flag of a rainbow. Cyril wears army camouflage and we watch his somber face declaring disaster. The army declares war on the whole society and we wake up on Friday and it is the first day of death. The people are told, panicked at, by the machine of governance to stay behind the cast spell of the rainbow. The people take this as a suggestion. I speak to a comrade who says, maybe it's that the people have become accustomed to ways of dying. Maybe it's that the lives of the people have been a long still morning on a battlefield. Maybe it's at the center of the field. There where the safety is, is nothing but a PR camouflage for the disaster inside. Maybe, maybe it's that the rainbow is dead. It's powerless. It's magic having seeped out, has coughed up its key parts and revealed itself a hollow death chamber. Maybe it's that the people have always been waking up to a tomorrow of death. A beginning. In Wuhan, China in 2019 sometime at a wet market, so they say, a trader contracted a virus from some of the goods on sale. This virus spreads as viruses do. We can fill in the blanks ourselves. He arrives home that night and his partner has prepared a warm fish soup for dinner. It is colder than usual for this time of year and she, worried about, she worries about his health rubbing scales with the exotic. At this point, of course, they are unaware that this exotic has come home with the trader on his scales. And today he had thought himself lucky, having sold a bit more than usual. He might have walked home with a skip in his step, feeling stronger than he has in a long time now. His partner, say she's a nurse, comes home later and warms up the fish stew and brushes her hair sitting at the foot of their shared bed. She climbs into bed next to him and holds him while he coughs and wheezes delicately into the night. The virus slides with the sweat between them and gets inside her body into her bones. Then next morning she goes to work and carries it to the hospital. Her son goes to school and carries it into the yard. Our trader goes to the supermarket and carries it with him there. Meanwhile, here, there is a party at Tin Roof and all the kids go. So do you. And you read in your mother's paper that morning that everyone's infected. Meanwhile here, there is a lock-in party at Camps Bay where all the wild things are, and so are you, a wild thing. You see on Insta a tweet as you slide into bed at the end of the night that everyone's infected. Meanwhile here, there is an underground rave in Woodstock with the long head headbangers and you with your piercings that sparkle dangerously in the dim lights. Your friend wakes you up with a frantic call that everyone's infected. Meanwhile here, there is a picnic for 12, now 200. The whole school's here, even the great ace, even in the vast garden of some matric boy. The house gets raided by blue flashing lights and you leave head drooped, shame face trailing behind your father who came to pick you up long past curfew. Everyone's infected. Meanwhile here, everyone's infected. It's fine anyway. We're youth, they say. This thing is not for us. They say this and that, like black people said and white people said and rich people said and so on, Simon said. It's fine. Anyway, I'm strong. And 
in my prime of it, my youth, I'm not even 17 yet or 21 or 27. Miss me with that stay inside, wear a mask, sanitize pandemic rule book like a Bible falling on my head. I'm sprawled out on my back on the floor of some lounge at some house party, varsity kids, I think. And I look like a cartoon with dizzy stars circling about my head. Not sick, no, but foolish. And everyone's infected. It's fine anyway, we're never going to die. Meanwhile, there, there are a hundred funerals a week and all the morgues are at capacity. Meanwhile, there, the entire household down to the 14 year old is decimated by a cold that slipped in through the door on the sole of your classmate's shoe. Meanwhile, there, the economy slows to evictions, joblessness, homelessness, almost to a halt and the bottom falls out. Meanwhile, there, the country in rupture, enraptured by itself, as we all tumbled forward to a world we will never again return from, swaying at the wreckage of the world we will never again return to. Meanwhile, there, the planet spins its slow spinning thing, sickening, dizzying, and we fall off, or they do, not us. Meanwhile, there, not us, is not enough to still the onslaught of death like a plague, a pandemic raising the landscape. We pitchforked in a stalemate with a fiend fire that will burn through both metal and flesh. There is no going back. It is an ashy morning looking out at the burnt battlefield. We are fielding with counterattacks and our various defenses, only ever effective when done by all those who constitute the whole. There is no going back to the hot, wild parties you threw when you ran naked to the water and swam there at 1 a.m. in your youthful mischief. The sloppy, slipping, spitting of too many kisses in one night from other beautiful kids you saw from the corner of your eye in assembly all year and hoped a maskless world for a more friendly time. Because meanwhile, while we, the youth, are at the bars and clubs and raves and house parties, the people are on the margins of the city and government structures built to survive a summer PR tour, but not much else. And the virus is finding its way in through the crack in the window. The headlines read, not all is lost, while the pandemic rocks us gently in its suffocating embrace. The mask, a wound and an equalizer and a reminder. Thank you. Khadiswa, that was just wonderful. Um, really an amazing intervention, quite right. And, and we appreciate that. So I'm going to say her name again, Khandiswa James. She is somebody you can call on um, and she truly, uh, we are delighted to have had you and, and had your presence this afternoon, reminding us indeed the time that we live in but perhaps um, as we are researchers, uh, programmers, service providers, activists, advocates, um, reminding us that um, there is hope for the future and we will return um, stronger indeed. Um, so I hope a lot of food for thought. Um, I'm going to move straight on now to a recording from Professor Audrey Pettifor. Uh, Audrey is an epidemiologist whose research focuses on sexual behavior and determinants of HIV STI infection in Sub-Saharan Africa. Her goal is to identify modifiable risk factors and develop novel interventions to prevent HIV. She has expertise in sexual behavior, HIV prevention, HIV testing, and structural interventions. Uh, very famous indeed for her wonderful um, cash transfer study known as HPT in 086, uh, but perhaps less well known. She's actually worked in South Africa for more than 20 years and has conducted research in Malawi, Madagascar, Kenya, Zimbabwe, and the DRC. And so um, unfortunately, Audrey wasn't able to be with us in person. Uh, I know she would have liked to be, but uh, this is a recording uh, that she made just this week. Um, so, Audrey Pettifor. Good afternoon. Um, sorry, I can't be there with you all in person. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, so that you can see my slides. So it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. And um, I'm going to talk to you about some research that we've been doing, particularly here um, I'm in North Carolina at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um,
And we've been doing a lot of work here um, on on young people and how COVID's been impacting them. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a survey and some some research we've been doing here on campus um, and also sort of some of the implications of that. And so this quote I thought was really um, sort of a nice example of thinking about COVID and young people. So college only happens one time and I'm not gonna let COVID-19 stop me from having fun. And this was really, um, we pulled from one of our surveys because we were trying to understand in the context of what was happening when the pandemic um, sort of started uh, taking off here um, in the US, both in the spring of 2020, but then again in the fall when we started bringing students back to campus, how young people were feeling about this, particularly when I think some young people were hoping when we brought young people in the fall of 2020 back to school, back to university, that you know they were going to get this experience of what they anticipated, and it ended up being really different. So I'm going to talk to you about some of our findings today and hope that in the context of thinking about HIV, I think a lot of what we know, um, particularly with such a new pandemic about behavior in young people, we have taken insights from HIV prevention um, and, and what we know about risk behavior and try to apply that to COVID. And, you know, I think it will be interesting to see where that does align and, and doesn't align. So firstly, just to acknowledge that obviously COVID-19 has altered everyone's lives profoundly in many ways, um, and particularly young people's lives. Um, I think at this point in September of 2021, um, especially here in the US, we're all feeling really exhausted. I think everyone is, but particularly after sort of the anticipation of the vaccines sort of being able to return us to normal. And now we're kind of in this place of a surge again in the US. And, and having to rethink about prevention and, and masks and can I do that, is that safe? It, it all feels like a lot. Um, but just to remind us about where young people are developmentally. So, you know, this was, this really like had, you know, although we all, many of us had to stay home from work and we may have experienced really profound effects in terms of illness and death in our lives, um, you know, young people, stop going to school in many settings here. I mean, my kids were doing online virtual school um, for almost a year and a half um, where they were in their rooms on a Zoom screen. Um, so, you know, that part, school as being a fundamental part of young people's lives was disrupted. They weren't able to socialize with their peers in many cases. So, you know, they were being told to stay home and all of the things that go along with socialization and key life events were Were disrupted. So, you know, whether that were plays in school or the things you do like sports teams and sports events, um, dating for the first time or, or perhaps in general, right, but learning that um, to date, having that opportunity went away, uh, particularly here, high school graduations, college graduations, and all the events that go along with that were, um, were canceled in many cases. Um, and, and other rites of passage that were are really significant and part of learning to become an adult. And, and, and also that I think young people look forward to or see and characterize as part of what it means to, to be an adolescent, to be a young person. Um, so I would argue, yes, it's been hard on all of us in different ways, but I think especially hard on young people. Um, so to, I, I'm an epidemiologist, although I do a lot of behavioral social uh, work and have I've worked obviously in South Africa for a long time in HIV prevention with young people, but, and that's kind of got what got me thinking about how young people were thinking about um, prevention in the case of COVID-19 when I couldn't travel and come to South Africa, what could I do locally? But just to say here in the US, so this was in 2020 in August of September, which is when um, universities went back in the fall of 2020, there was a, a you know, really rapid increase in COVID-19 cases in young people 18 to 22 years of age in the U.S. And this was significant, you know, because they, they were seeing, because they were having high, high infection rates, but also that a lot of young people um, are thought to be asymptomatic. Um, and so, you know, they may not recognize that they have COVID-19 and may continue to spread it in the community. Um, also, you know, this is similar because they're more likely to be asymptomatic. You know, young people have really been less likely to experience severe disease, which is great. Um, we are seeing with Delta that maybe 
we're not totally sure <laughs> with the data <laughs> what it means. We are seeing more young people in the hospitals, and maybe that's because more older people are vaccinated um, right now. But I think this idea that for young people, you know, maybe this disease isn't something they need to worry about too much because they may not face really serious consequences. And that has challenges for thinking about prevention for sure. Um, so like I said, this is sort of going back to um, this time last year, actually it was at UNC, it was in August of 2020, but across the fall last year, um, a lot of schools shifted remotely. So they kind of came back, brought everybody back. And at the UNC, we brought everyone back. And very quickly, um, even with prevention measures in place, no vaccines, but masks, um, reduced capacity in dorms, um, there, was, there were really large outbreaks in, in dormitories where, where students were living. And um, the dormitories were almost essentially closed, except for some very exceptional circumstances. And students were sent home. A lot of students here just moved to off-campus housing or those that were living in off-campus housing stayed there, but a lot of students who lived in the dorms went home. Um, and this happened, you can see third North Carolina college announces remote learning after COVID clusters from the first two weeks. So, um, you know, this was really, I think, took many, even the infectious disease experts will tell you here at UNC, it took them by surprise how rapidly this happened. And this was pre-Delta, right? With like, you know, a strain of COVID that wasn't even that infectious. We saw a really rapid takeoff, which I don't think was surprising given high density housing that young people were living in, um, in college campuses. And also that, you know, we think of college often with a lot of socialization and spending time with a lot of people, um, parties and other types of activities, um, and, and that those are sort of ripe for, for COVID-19 transmission. This is just a map from last fall. The New York Times was doing a nice job of tracking what we were seeing in terms of COVID cases on campus campuses across the US. And so you can basically see like, you know, there were many universities in the US that had, you know, over 3000 cases last fall. Um, just, you know, college campuses were a place where we were seeing a lot of transmission. Um, and so this is just to, to fast forward to today to think, I just want to like put this in context of, yes, like we have seen high transmission in young people and we continue to see that. And I think the challenge now that we have vaccines in our pocket is that young people, at least in the U.S., continue to be um, a group with the lowest uh, vaccination uptake, even here where it's been available to those 12 and up for a while. Um, we still see low uptake in, in young people, um, particularly, and so this is different, in, um, and I'll talk about one of these challenges. College, you know, people with more education and college education tend to be the group more likely to be vaccinated. So it is often folks with less education, um, higher poverty, kind of more marginalized populations where we're seeing less vaccination. Um, however, I think young people continue to be a group that we're facing a challenge to get vaccinated. And I think part of that, you know, part of it may be particularly we hear things like, well, the side effects of the vaccine may be worse than the disease itself. I think that's been changing a little bit with the Delta variant, but it continues to be a challenge as, as prevention specialists. We need to think about how do we message the importance of prevention when risk is perceived to be low. So we started this survey last fall and we wanted to originally kind of, this is a very epi question, look at um, seroprevalence among different groups because we had all of this sort of movement among students. We had students who came back to campus and left. We had some students who never came back to campus when, the, when things started in the fall. And we had students who kind of stayed and, and never left. And we were curious like what infection levels looked like in those different groups, but we were also interested in kind of behavioral factors, attitudes and behaviors associated um, with COVID-19 and what that would look like. So um, last fall, actually it was November when we started this, but we um, sent an email to all of our undergraduate students here at UNC. And there's about 20,000 undergraduate students here. Um, and um, we asked them to take part in an online survey that they could do at home. And if they would be willing to collect a blood specimen using this cool little device, it's called a TASO. It comes in the mail, you can stick it on your arm, press a button, and it collects a very small amount of blood that we could use then to test for um, seroprevalence, to look for antibodies to COVID-19. So this could all be done no matter where you were living um, at home. And so we had a, a little over a thousand respondents who completed the survey and provided a sample between um, November and January 
of last year. And we've continued to do two more rounds of the survey. I'm only going to present to you the baseline here just to get you thinking, because I think there's sort of some interesting things we tried to ask in the face of some of the challenges we were having with sort of contact tracing and um, yeah, just trying to think about how to message prevention to, to, to college students last fall. So interestingly, and maybe not surprising given what happened here on campus at UNC last fall, you know, over half of people said they thought there was a moderate chance, uh, moderate to high chance that they could get COVID-19 in the next year. But, you know, there still was a fair amount who thought, you know, it was only a slight chance, which is interesting um, given, given how, um, how high the incidence has been on, on our campus here. Um, because this was a convenience sample, Interestingly, you know, over 20% of people said that they had ever been diagnosed with or were thought they had, you know, been suspected of having COVID-19. And so you can see here, the majority of people fell into this. Yes, they had, they thought they had symptoms, but they never had a diagnosis of COVID-19. Whereas um, 38 people in this group said, yes, they had had, um, you know, a positive nasal, nasal or saliva test. Um, so, and, and about 77% said they had never, they didn't think that they had had COVID. Interestingly, we sort of looked at seroprevalence here by, um, so overall the sample seropositivity was 9% from, from when we did it. And when we looked at it by different sort of groups, we saw that people who were student athletes, who participated in Greek life, which are sort of um, social organizations on campus called fraternities and sororities. You, you may be familiar with that, but that's considered sort of Greek organizations. So they're social clubs. They were much more likely um, to have had COVID. And then interestingly, people who reported being sexually active at the time of the survey completion, which may just also be a proxy for, um, for socialization more generally. We asked, we also looked at sort of activities in the past month that young people had participated in and, you know, not surprisingly um, saw that people who had kind of been to an athletic event outside like a football game or a soccer game were more likely to have had COVID. Um, I don't know if this is statistically significant, but we thought it was interesting that people said they had kissed someone they didn't know very well in the past month were a little more likely to have had COVID and things you would expect, like having been to a restaurant or bar inside been to an indoor party with 10 or more people with no masks um, and been in a car with people you don't live with with no masks. Interestingly, those were all higher um, seroprevalence. So one of the things we were trying to get at at the time is just, you know, and I, I think about this in the context of HIV where we do role playing around condom use or asking somebody um, if they're willing to tell like a partner, if they'd be willing to test for HIV and the social norms and challenges that go along with that. And so here we were trying to get at this idea of like, when you're living with a group of people that you don't know very well, who may be your roommates, how do you navigate mask wearing? How do you navigate, um, let's say your roommate bringing some friends home that you don't know and you don't live with and they all start hanging out with you in this room where you're in. What are you going to do? Like, how do you navigate that situation? Because peer pressure and social norms could perhaps put you in a situation where you might feel like you need to do something that you might not be comfortable doing. So we had these scenarios and we gave them these possible um, uh, you know, responses. And it's interesting, you know, 48% of people said they would leave the room and go somewhere else. But there was a mix of people who were like, you know, I would just stay and hang out with them without a mask. Like, okay, you know, um, 6% they would said they would hang out with them and put the mask on, which is probably might be like one of the harder things to do, maybe. 19% um, said they'd ask the the friends to put masks on, which is interesting. And then 9% said they would ask the friends to leave. So, you know, I think it's interesting that there is no one response, but certainly kind of thinking about, you know, if you were going to take these, what, how would you approach this conversation to ask the friends to put a mask on? Like, how would you ask them to leave? seems like, you know, maybe asking them to put a mask on um, is something that we could like, you know, thinking about health education materials. How would you, how would you promote that? What kind of thing would you say um, before just avoiding the situation and leaving? Um, this was another scenario we gave students, you and two roommates decide to go out on a Friday night, you all leave the house and are wearing masks and you go to a friend's house who invited you over for a socially distanced outdoor party. 
when you get there, everyone is inside and no one's wearing a mask, right? So it's not what you were expecting. So what do you do? Do you leave because there's too many people and no masks are on and they're inside? Okay. Most people said that's what they would do. Um, 13% said that they would talk to the host and see if they could move the party outside. 10% said they would go inside wearing their mask. Interestingly, 10% said they'd go inside with their mask on, but, you know, they'd eventually take it off, right? Social pressure, peer pressure, they'd probably take it off at some point. Um, and 4% said they'd just go inside and take their mask off and join everybody and, you know, have a good time. So I, I just think it's, I just thought it was interesting. We weren't sure, how these. we made these questions up and we didn't know how they would test. So to me, it's just interesting that we got some variation here. Um, and I think thinking about these scenarios and, and how we could use them to help people uh, role play and practice um, negotiating and thinking through their decisions before they're in these situations. Um, going to the idea of kind of <laughs> missing out on key life events, we we had some sort of attitude and behaviors and some of them um, attitude types of questions and a lot of them were were pretty standard, but you know, we added these questions. One was um, young people should get COVID-19 so that they get immunity to the virus and then they can get on with normal activities. Um, interestingly, people who endorsed that um, had a much higher prevalence, maybe not surprising, <laughs> of COVID. So we saw that, you know, a, a significant relationship between that attitude and having had COVID before. So um, the odds uh, ratio, the prevalence ratio was 3.42 and significant. Um, we also asked this question, college only happens one time, and I'm not going to let COVID-19 stop me from having fun or from doing the social activities that are part of the college experience. Um, again, we saw both people um, who strongly agreed, but also people who didn't agree or disagree, so they kind of were neutral on this statement, were more likely to, um, to have had covid um, and, and have a, there was a significant association, so almost two times more likely compared to people who disagreed with that statement. So I think kind of this idea, again, of like, um, I, I, I'm curious where the idea that, you know, I probably won't get very sick. And, you know, we heard at least last fall this idea, just like get it over with so you don't have to worry about it anymore. And I will say I've heard that from friends. I know that, you know, with, we think about HIV, especially um, in the in the gay and the, MS, the men who have sex with men community, that sometimes that's something I've heard. I've heard that from other young people, this idea that this probably will happen and I'd rather just have it happen so I can stop worrying about it. Um, and this idea of like, I don't, you know, I'm not gonna let this stop me from living my life. Okay, um, this was a separate survey. We actually did ask about mental health also in this survey. Um, I, I'm, I don't have the data here, but we had done a survey in the summer of 2020 with young people um, as well to try and understand sort of the impacts of having been sent home. At this point, they got sent home in the spring of 2020 from the university. And I think as has been seen um, in a lot of research about the impact of the pandemic on mental health, I guess I just wanted to put this in here because um, it's, to me, it's just a really, really important that we acknowledge the impact of these disruptions on young people's lives and everybody. I think we've seen high levels of depression and anxiety across the board, irrespective of, of age, but certainly we are seeing really hot, hot saw and I'd be curious to see if we're still seeing, I think there's a lot of exhaustion right now and potentially also high levels of depression. But, you know, at the time that we did this, which was um, June of 2020, you know, 66% of students in this survey reported some symptom indicative of depression. Um, you know, 67% reported loneliness and, and a little over half reported greater stress than before the pandemic. So um, I think these are just things we need to continue to think about. I know we talk a lot about this in, in the case of HIV and HIV prevention in young people, but just to remind us all that, that um, addressing mental health is a really key and essential part of thinking about prevention. Um, I just wanted to highlight this. I don't know if people have seen this. I hadn't seen it until I was preparing for this talk, but kind of it's a short, but I think, you know, nice, succinct um, document that the WHO has put out on considerations for promoting safe behavior um, when thinking about COVID for young people. And a lot of it draws from HIV. So I think those of us in this field will, will you know, find a lot of this really familiar. But, you know, I, I think these things about establishing positive social norms in peer groups that we were just talking about around mask wearing and um, safer behavior 
promoting feelings of empathy and pro-social motivation. This particularly, I think about mm, vaccination where we've been talking about, yes, a vaccine can pr protect you, but it also could really protect your community and vulnerable people that you care about, like your grandparents, like your parents. Um, and that may be more of a motivating factor to get vaccinated than, than for themselves. Um, engage young people in communicating risks. So how do we talk about that? building young people's confidence in their ability to protect themselves, facilitating social connections. I think that's really important in the case of, of um, mental health and how do we create an enabling environment that helps people make say, healthier, safer decisions. I think all of these are probably things that resonate, but I think um, particularly some of the social norm stuff, I think for adolescents to me really, um, really resonated. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to end on is just, kind of doing these surveys with young people and, you know, was thinking about how is this all going to play out in vaccine uptake before we had a vaccine approved the last year, um, thinking about this and um, was thinking about wanting to kind of, you know, do some vaccine hesitancy work among young people on college campuses here. And, you know, um, the, the COVID prevention network was interested in looking at, um, how effective the vaccines were in preventing transmission and that college students given the high incidence and the high density living might be a really good population to do this study in. And so um, all of a sudden I was <laughs> a study co-chair on this CovePN3006 study called Prevent COVID U. The U was for university. And we um, started thinking about this study last fall, our time fall, so like November, October, November of 2020. But um, you know, it took a long time to get this off the ground and funded. And once we actually got the study funded and in the field, um, universities were rolling out vaccination. Um, in fact, like when we opened our site here at UNC, we opened the same week that Campus Health had huge vaccine clinics on campus. So before where students may have signed up um, to be in this study um, to, to, for access to the vaccine, um, once that, you know, vaccines were, were, were available, a lot of people just went and got them, which was great, but it definitely has been a challenge for recruiting into this study. Um, the, let's see if I can get to the next slide. There we go. The, the main questions we were asking, and this has shifted as with everything COVID, things are moving so fast, um, and clinical trials are not always fast. <laughs> as many of you may know. So, you know, we wanted to still look at the question of how well the vaccines were protecting people from getting infected. Although that is, I think, less of um, a critical question these days. There's a lot of data that they work very well. We know obviously for hospitalization and death, and I think we're, we've been getting lots of data on, on asymptomatic infection since the trials were published. But, you know, we are basically asking people to collect daily nasal swabs that they do at home um, and then, for four months so that we can really look at viral kinetics um, in the nose when people get infected to see what the differences are between people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated. But the big question we really wanted to, to, be, to answer is around, do the vaccines prevent transmission? And so, you know, there's, there's limited data on this. Um, you know, we kind of, I think recently with Delta have been seeing higher um, cycle time values from the PCR test in people who are vaccinated. So similar high levels. So um, suggesting there's a lot of virus in the nose of people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated. But we don't actually know what that value means in terms of like actually transmitting to another person. We're assuming that that's a proxy for infectious virus in the nose, but we don't necessarily know that. Um, so this question of like, do young people who have virus and a lot of virus in their nose, whether they're vaccinated or unvaccinated, what does the transmission pattern look like between these groups is something we really wanted to answer um, in this study. I'll just say it's been a journey. It's been a challenge. And um, we've got over 40 sites now in the U.S. We had to expand outside of college um, campuses and college students when we saw such, you know, basically in the spring of 2021 a lot of colleges really pushed to get their students vaccinated quickly. So there were not a lot of unvaccinated students to recruit. So we expanded the study um, up to age 29 and um, tried to move off campus. We have, you know, over 1800 students or 
people enrolled in the study right now. And basically they're randomized to get the vaccine now or standard of care, which is essentially like they can go get vaccinated whenever they want in their community. Um, and if they don't, we will offer it to them four months later. And then we have actually a cohort. We added a vaccine declined people because we are seeing such high levels of vaccine uptake that we were worried we wouldn't have a comparison group. Um, but it's hard to find these people in the U.S. right now, folks who are vaccine hesitant at this stage of the pandemic or a vaccine rollout, maybe, are um you know, are challenging to find. And they are often people who are um, a little bit skeptical of, of science. So, um, you know, we've been trying to find them. I will say we're in the process of, we're under a, um, a shift right now. So we are moving to a fully observational study where we will be recruiting anyone who's vaccinated and anyone unvaccinated and still looking at these questions of um, viral kinetics in the nose, but really, really trying to focus on um, transmission pairs and getting people to enroll together. I will say it's been very difficult, um, particularly with the younger college students, to get them to enroll close contacts. And I didn't present this data, but one of the things we asked in our survey on campus was about um, their willingness to kind of provide names for contact tracing. And, you know, we did see that people, young people endorsed the idea that they would not want to give their friends names because of the implications of what it means when you have to quarantine and isolate. So, you know, if I tell um, the health department that my friend was a close contact, now my friend's going to have to stay home and my friend's going to get mad at me because I gave up her name and, you know, what all of the social consequences that come with that. Um, we've also heard from some of our sites, um, you know, just the idea that you don't like give up info about your peers. Like it's just not something that's done. Um, it's not cool. It's not okay. So it has been really hard to get um, young people to enroll close contacts into the study. So we are looking at expanding um, to much higher age groups and younger age groups so that households and families and others, and we can kind of, you know, enroll bigger groups um, to look at transmission. But these are some of the cool um, some stickers that we developed. We've got a lot of social media campaigns. This is one of them that was really trying to not stigmatize young people who haven't been vaccinated yet, but say, hey, like, it's okay that you aren't yet vaccinated, but there's an opportunity for you. So, right, procrastination is about to pay off. You can um, if you haven't gotten your shot yet, you can still help everyone get back to normal life and get paid doing it. So, so trying to make these young people feel like they can still contribute, um, and get their shot and it's okay. Not like wagging your finger to say, you know, how dare you not have gotten vaccinated yet? Um, since we're trying to appeal to kind of a group that haven't yet chosen to be vaccinated. And that is the end here. So I'm hoping that, um, some of these thoughts will, will, um, allow you all to, to continue thinking about how, how the lessons learned from, from HIV will contribute to thinking about COVID prevention and vaccine uptake. And um, it was lovely to get to share with you. I'm sorry I'm not there in person to get to answer questions, but I'm sure you'll all have a great discussion. And thank you for having me here today. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you, Audrey. Always um, great value. So just brilliant work being done there in Chicago. Um, so thanks to Audrey. I'm going to turn in the interest of time quickly to your uh, mentee.com. I hope you've all been able to get that down on your phones. Um, and now is the moment to actually rank those. So again, quickly, those rank options for the importance for research on adolescence and COVID. So choose those um, and get them into rank order. Um, and then secondly, rank these strategies in order of which is the most effective for maintaining adolescent retention in HIV care during COVID-19. So again, there you've got four choices. I'm gonna give you just a moment uh, to get that done while I introduce the panel. Um, so, uh, Becca Zeller will be coming back um, and joining us on the panel. Um, and I'm going to remind you all, many multitasking activities here this evening, that you will submit any questions you might have in the, in the um, uh, so the chat. I'm not seeing Q&A. So I think it's going to go into the chat. Emmanuel, tell me if I'm wrong on that. 
Um, but let me introduce to you uh, two panelists who will be joining us together with Becca Zella. The first is Dr. Danielle Javenko. So Danielle is a behavioral scientist. Um, she was a fellow at the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation. She, maintained, she is still part of our faculty there. Um, she completed her doctoral uh, work through UNC um, and has recently moved to Brown's University to do her postdoc. So Danielle has a great interest in, um, in uh, um, young people in uh, young key populations. Um, and so it's a pleasure to have Danielle. And then secondly, we're welcoming one of our senior medical scientists um, and investigators of record, Dr. Pippa MacDonald. Uh, so Pippa is uh, based at Emma von Lenny at the Desmond Tutu HIV Center. And like Becca Zella, she uh, is conducting a number of adolescent uh, related research protocols, TB, HIV, um, and, and various HPV and other um, communicable diseases. So I'm going to invite Pippa, Danielle, and Becca Zella to join me. But before we do that, let's just do the mentee uh, poll, Danielle. So I'm just sorry about that. I'm just going to look at the polls because we're going to be interested in seeing the results here. Um, so first rank here goes to impact of COVID-19 and risk reduction short strategies on social and structural outcomes. So terrific. Uh, that's our first. Second is COVID-19 vaccine. Third is increasing uptake of COVID-19 prevention more broadly. And fourth is COVID-19 outcomes in adolescents. I would certainly uh, agree with those rankings. Uh, very important. So thank you, everyone. Um, that's of interest. And then our second mentee uh, uh, poll, yeah, you see them organizing themselves. So the, the strategy which we think is most effective for adolescent retention would be providing virtual psychological support. Uh, close on that, multi-month prescriptions and dispensing, very close to that, uh, ensuring continuity of supply chains and lastly, providing virtual conference support. So again, I think spot on, you guys have done brilliantly. I don't know that there is a right or wrong answer, but I certainly think would I, I would have ranked it in this way. Um, I agree with first and second being very close. Um, and we'll be hearing from Danielle Javenko, uh, perhaps about a study we're doing that really explores both of those aspects um, in a moment. So thank you uh, for passing on the, uh, the polls. Um, and now I'm going to invite Pippa and Becca Zella to join us uh, with their cameras on, if possible. Fantastic. Hi. So um, perhaps just so everybody knows who you are, Danielle, do you want to just say hi? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you uh, for the introduction, Linda Gallon, for having me. Great. And then Pippa. Hi everyone, it's absolutely great to be here. Have loved those presentations. I um, hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Great, thanks Pippa. It's lovely to see you in black and white. That's sort of different and interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay, great. So um, I, I really hope you'll be placing your uh, your questions in the, uh, in the chat sec section. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to start actually right there, um, Danielle, and ask you to literally in two or three minutes just describe the buddy study because I think it's of, of interest given, given one of those polls. Yeah, so we have this study going on at DTHF um, right now where we are piloting an ARV service delivery system where young people living with HIV 13 to 24 have the option to have their uh, medication delivered to them using a courier service. Um, so this is being done in Google 8 too. And um, this is basically so that the young people don't have to go to the clinic during COVID. And our hope is that this will improve um, retention and care. So this is a pilot study um, that is particularly relevant now in the era of COVID, but also something that I think this community has needed for um, a long time. Um, so, 
yeah, I mean, just to kind of speak a little bit about like the relevance of this in terms of the conversations we've had today, I think that we've seen that um, everything we've learned in, re in relation to HIV prevention and care for adolescents now really needs to be adapted for COVID. And while these lessons that we've learned over the past 10, 20 years still apply, there are these really um, big like new gaps in delivery and acceptance and feasibility um, because of COVID that we need to kind of address to avoid setbacks in our progress. Um, so I think one of the big things is delivery platforms need to be adapted to respond to the COVID crisis, which includes expanding um, digital outreach, which is, which is what we're trying to do with our study, um, doing it mostly remote. Um, it is fully remote if the participants uh, prefer that. Um, and I think like a key issue that we've been struggling with is ensuring that adolescents um, who sometimes don't have access to the internet or a mobile device are not left behind in this research because this is a really important shift. But if we're losing this key population here, um, you know, that, that would be a, a big setback in, um, in ensuring that we're, we're hitting these HIV prevention and care outcomes. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about what, what we've been working on and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Danielle. I'm going to turn now to Pippa. Just, I was struck by something Audrey and Becca Zella had to say about, you know, how how young people sort of process this stuff. And we know that in uh, in HIV, we've also had to battle with low risk perception. Young people don't recognise that they may be at risk of HIV. And I know you grappled with that on Reach and in other studies. Um, what do you think might what, what do you employ as your most important strategy to try and sort of bring that, that concept home that you too, you know, might be at risk of, of COVID on the one hand, but in our case, HIV or indeed TB for that matter. I know you've also had some TB studies. So what, what, what's your most important, your favorite strategy in this regard? I must say it's um it's a challenge and adolescents um provide us with lots of interest and I think we um we know that adolescents their limbic system as we all know seems to develop before their prefrontal cortex so they are risk takers just like Becca Zella said and I'm I'm not sure Becca Zella if you saw the same in the REACH study but we saw um a huge amount of sexually transmitted infections, STIs, up to about 30% of our participants had STIs, um, despite all the counseling, all the involvement um, within our REACH study, just showing how risk-taking they are. I think they thought they weren't prepped, so maybe they didn't need to prevent STIs. But I think my favorite way of trying to prevent all of, prevent HIV, prevent the STIs, prevent COVID, is communication. And communication with adult adolescents is definitely by cell phones, if we can. They love devices, love gadgets. So we would try and invite them when we could into our research clinic, into our adolescent-friendly area, where we would try and supply Wi-Fi to the best of our ability. We would have computers so that if they want to do some work, develop their CVs, if they were looking for jobs, um, so that they could come in. And then we would take that opportunity to obviously talk to them um, and try and promote, promote prevention. In those areas, we would promote the mask wearing, but allow them to socialize in a safe environment where we could provide education um, about all those things, about COVID and HIV. Thanks, Pippa. So, so building on that a little bit, Pe Becca Zella, what, what did you think was the greatest challenge that COVID brought um, in your trial site? I know you, you gave us a nice array of all the possibles, but what, what, what on the ground was really the biggest challenge that COVID, COVID introduced into, into the studies? Um, thank you, Linda. Thank you, um, Kiba, for that response. Um, if I may start with um, expanding on what Kiba said, uh, I think the greatest um, strategy in involving um, adolescents 
is the continuous or the persistent engagement. If we look into the design of MTN034, our participants were coming in for, for monthly visits and their counseling was very intense. Um, we also participated in the HPTN082 study. If we look at those two studies, if we look at those two studies, there is a huge difference in terms of the engagement of the participants. The HPTN082 was um, not as intense as MTN034. And I think that's why we got the results that we got in the interim results for MTN034. Um, um, then in terms of um, the greatest challenge that was brought by the COVID-19 pandemic, I think it was mainly um, the logistics into the participants coming into the clinic and um, the impact on, on, on adherence. Um, it's in the initial uh, first lockdown period for three weeks in Zimbabwe, we actually had a great challenge in bringing in participants into the clinic, the outreach staff had to go out into the um, into the homes and bringing in participants for the clinic um, visits. Then, in terms of adherence, I was I'll speak for an example in about an example in MTN 034. We actually saw a trend in the drug level feedbacks for one of our participants because of the COVID uh, 19 challenge. This participant, um, because of COVID 19, the husband lost. Um, his job and they'd move into the parents. And the participant at that time was on, on Trovata for, for, for PrEP. And it was difficult for the participant to take a PrEP at that time. And you would see that the drug level feedback would shift from the green to the yellow. And when the, um, um, the participant and the husband got alternative um, accommodation, there was a shift again from the yellow to the green. So I think the, um, the, the most challenge from the COVID-19 pandemic, it was transporting the logistics of transport to the site, as well as the impact on adherence. Thank you. Thanks, Becca Zella. I'm going to turn back to you then, Danielle, and staying with the buddy study. I mean, I see a, a remark in the, in the chat around psychosocial support, and I absolutely agree with Becca Zella and Pippa that communication is key. Now, you've combined those two in terms of providing psychosocial support using um, adolescent devices. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the the pros and the cons, the, the difficulties that we've experienced um, sort of using that as a strategy, reaching young people through their devices. Yeah, so we do have a, a component of our study where we're um, trying to provide support using text messages to participants. It's a randomized component of the study to see if that has an impact on um, engagement and care. I think one of the hardest things has been is, I'm, I guess a con of this is that um, I think that a lot of these young people um, were relying on kind of like the support they were, the in-person support they received when they used to go to the clinic. Um, so them knowing the clinic staff and, you know, having that support that they might, um, they might not have been getting at home. Um, so I definitely think that that is a con. Um, another con is, is difficulties with confidentiality when these youth are not using their own phone. Um, because, you know, we obviously don't want to exclude people who don't have their own mobile device from being in the study because um, everyone should have access to the service, but then you're, you know, you're risking, you know, increasing the risk for these other issues by breaching confidentiality. Um, I think the, pro the pros are, are simply, you know, not losing this point of contact because we know that once you lose that point of contact, um, it may be hard to get it back. So I do think that the mobile um, component you know, can provide that um, little bit of psychosocial social support and might be needed just to keep them engaged until we can be back in person. Uh, but I definitely don't think it's, um, you know, solving the problem completely. Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks, Danielle. Pippa, changing gears just a little bit, I was quite interested in Audrey's study that they were taking regular samples from, from those young people on colleges. I mean, and, you know, in the COVID era, of course, it's lots of, of nasal swabs and so on. But, you know, is, is this a challenge? Is it a major challenge? Is it something we have to really think about in, on the ground? We often hear the fear of needles is a factor, but is that, does it play out in your hands, um, you know, when you're conducting these, these prevention trials and other trials? 
You're muted, Pippa. Um, talking about, um, are you asking about um, taking lots of COVID swabs as an issue? Or samples in general, you know, yeah. around one aspect of involving adolescents in research. I, I, I was just intrigued that, you know, Audrey was able to get these kids to come regularly and have COVID samples done, but, but we obviously have them back to get blood samples and mm. urine samples and, and, and. So what, 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 what is, you know, does that play out in your hands that kids yes. don't want to do this? Yes, I think definitely, and um, and definitely younger kids, um, but but even older. I mean, a lot of adolescents, young adults don't like having samples taken. Um, and in some of our studies, particularly O three four, as Becca Zeller will also have experience, we did more than just blood blood taking. We also did a lot of pelvic samples, a lot of swabs, and to do those, um, we had quite a few techniques actually to try and relax the participants. Um, because obviously it's a, it's a big deal, particularly if you are 16 or 17, having a pelvic exam and multiple swabs. So obviously trying to encourage them, relax them. We used to sometimes play a bit of music. I'm not sure they always liked my choice of music, so I had to be guided by them. But we play a bit of music. Um, but taking, but absolutely taking swabs, um, whether it's the pelvic swabs, whether it's lots of nasal swabs, and blood samples. Um, and if you're taking lots of blood samples, it can, it can be worrying um, and can be a deterrent. So once again, all about communication, having that adolescent friendly environment. And also, um, I think what Becca Zeller was saying about having young researchers, they love having young peers um, who they can communicate with. So either the researchers have that young face um, or peers that are brought on the same day who are having the same experiences they can communicate with. I think that can help. Great. So I see a question in the chat about whether Audrey Pettifor's COV-3006 is, is, um, is recruiting here in South Africa. Unfortunately not. It is only based in South Africa. I mean, in the US. Uh, but let me ask Becca Zello, because she comes from Zim, of course. Are there, do you know of any adolescent um, COVID studies that are, are running in your part of the world? Um, thank you, Linda. Um, at the moment, I'm not aware of any, but uh, there's the Impact uh, 2016 protocol that was uh, withheld because of the COVID-19 restrictions. Probably when the restrictions relax, it might it might kick off. Thank yeah, you. great, great. And Pippa, we'll be recruiting um, both the Lena Capavir and the Zlatravir studies. Do you want to just, in a nutshell, uh, describe them, uh, maybe in a sentence or two? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, the Impar study um, is um, giving month monthly is Latravir. Um, it's a double blind, double dummy study. So um, the participants will be getting is Latreva versus Truvada. And that is a really exciting study. It's for participants ages 16 until 45. So we're going to be having 16, 17 year olds, um, which is great. And obviously, is Latreva is very exciting, a once monthly prep pool. Um, the Len Capova study is six monthly subcut Len Capova injections being compared to Truvada, and that is an age of 16 to 25. Um, so both studies with adolescents, both prep studies um, and exciting studies. Yeah, so um, there is a lot of work going on. Um, and so, you know, watch the space and definitely an important time for us to be thinking about um, involving adolescents safely. Maybe I'll ask in the last three minutes before we wrap things up, Danielle, when you think about doing research in HIV um, or any disease for that matter and adolescents, what do you think is the most important ingredient that needs to come uh, to, to the field site or within the, the researchers themselves? Um, in relation to doing HIV research in during COVID, um, I mean, I think Audrey's data on the impact of uh, COVID on mental health is really interesting. 
Um, I mean, there's been a lot of papers during this pandemic on the impact of social isolation on poor mental health outcomes um, that is especially pronounced for young people everywhere globally. Um, so, I mean, but we also know that poor mental health affects HIV outcomes. So I think in countries uh, battling co-occurring epidemics, such as HIV or gender inequity, um, efforts to tackle COVID-19 really need to consider the potential impacts of COVID and these prevention measures um, on you know, the social and structural outcomes. Um, so, I mean, kind of what that poll was, was getting at, um, that it's really important we consider these factors such as the impacts on mental health and gender-based violence and you know, the potential impact those could have on HIV when designing um, these research projects and interventions. Thanks. What about on your side, Becca Zella? What, what do you think what is the most important ingredient? Um, I think the most important factor to consider is um, engaging with, with, with the adolescents. Um, because I think um, adolescents require persistency and continuous engagement for them to be able to participate fully in any or to commit fully in, in anything. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then Pippa, the last word. Couldn't agree more. I think engagement, communication, fun, lots of color, um, communication, um, communication engagement. Yeah, thanks, Pippa. I think you've really made that point uh, very well today. And I really want to thank each of the panelists. Um, and of course, um, uh, Audrey, in her absence, for just uh, putting those talks together, sharing with us today. Um, and, and thank you to all of you for engaging in this discussion. Without doubt, I want to thank Kondiswa James, who I think really caught the essence of the issues uh, that we face today. Um, and, you know, everything from the mental health um, all the way through to, to uh, perceptions and how young people are dealing with this, I think just brilliant. So um, I think it, what she had to say really summed it all up. Um, but I also wanna thank all of you for joining us today. We would really appreciate your feedback. What more would you like to have heard about? What else would you like to see in this webinar series? We are very excited about the prospects of bringing you another five. But if this goes well, we are really geared up to do this into time immemorial. So please let us know what you'd like to hear more about. If you have some uh, excellent speakers you'd like to suggest. And of course, here we are looking for young artists that we can expose and uh, share with you so that they too um, at this difficult time for artists, for uh, performers, we want to contribute across the board and just show that we really are in this together. We have solidarity. I want to thank Iman, Carrie, Melissa, the team who've helped to put this series together, and of course, everyone at IAVI. There will be a series of different panelists and different uh, moderators going forward. Please spread the word. Uh, we would love to see this webinar sold out. Um, and, and more and more people participating in adolescent uh, research and learning more about how to do this. So once again, thank you to all of you and see you next month. Thanks so much.